Well, if you have a syllabus, we're on page 38, and we are in our Bible uh, studying Deuteronomy chapter 5, and we are looking at some comments on verse 22 in Deuteronomy 5, verse 22. There was just one more, but it's too good to skip. We we read several last week that helped us to compare and put together the idea that Mount Sinai is a testimony of when Jesus comes back, the kind of things that are going to happen. Uh, for instance, he spoke the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai when as a part of when Jesus comes back, he holds the Ten Commandments in his hand and shows them to the world. And I was thinking, Sinai was early enough that people could change. But the next time he shows the Ten Commandments, it's too late. Nobody can change. If they didn't accept what happened on Sinai, then it will be too late for them at that point. So... It's a blessing, you know. Mount Sinai was a real blessing, yes. But there is a preamble there because they'll all be exposed to the third angel's message. Oh, yes. They, they won't have any excuse, will they? So here's one more. Uh, it's Great Controversy, page 640. And it says, The voice of God is heard from heaven, declaring the day and hour of Jesus' coming and delivering the everlasting covenant to his people. So again, as we uh, have the repetition of Sinai, uh, the voice of God speaks from heaven. This time he announces the day and hour that he's going to come. Now, some people got confused, and they said, Ellen White, is a false prophet because she said that she heard the day and the hour of Jesus coming and that she knows the day and the hour. And the Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour. So she's a false prophet. So she had to answer that question. And she said, I did hear the voice announcing the day and the hour, but I can't remember what it was. I don't, I don't have that information. You know, God can get, make a prophet forget. Did you know that? Yes. Last Sunday, in an exchange with a renegade Adventist friend of mine, he said, because Adventists say that Jesus will not come today, then they're saying they know when he won't come, so then that falsifies the Bible. That's kind of a long shot. <laughs> Yeah. That one's that one's a little uh, mixed up, I'd say. Like peals of loudest thunder, his words roll through the earth. That's the same thing that happened to Sinai. You know, it rolled through the earth. The Israel of God stand listening with their eyes fixed upward. Their countenances are lighted up with his glory and shine as did the face of Moses when he came down from Sinai. So one person's face was shining at Sinai, but the 144,000 will all have their faces shining at this point. And, uh, yeah, that's who, well, the special resurrection, then check out exactly whether that has already happened here. But, yeah, I think, I think it's probably happened here. So they too. The wicked cannot look upon them. And when the blessing is pronounced on those who have honored God by keeping his Sabbath holy, there is a mighty shout of victory. You can see why it would be, because the issue is Sunday Sabbath. And it looks like the Sunday keepers are winning. And they are able to cause pain and suffering and captivity and all kinds of things to the Sabbath keepers. But now, 
it is revealed that the Sabbath keepers were right. And their faces are shining just like Moses' face. And the, the Sunday keepers can't even look at it. They can't, they can't even look at their face. It's so bright. That's right. That's right. They will, they will have to admit defeat at that point. All right, going on to verse 23 and 4. There's no, I didn't find any comments on those two verses, so we'll read them. Deuteronomy 5, 23. And it came to pass... When ye heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness. Now remember, the book of Deuteronomy was given in a series of lectures when Moses knew he was going to die and the children of Israel were on the borders of the Jordan River and they were going to cross the Jordan River. This would be the second opportunity to enter the land of Canaan. And so... Uh, Moses is reminding the ones that were still alive, which uh, it would have to be those that were under 20, uh, because the other generation were all dead. But there were some that heard it as children. So he says, you heard the voice out of the midst of darkness. So it got very dark, for the mountains did burn with fire, so there was also a fire that ye came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. So when this experience was over, during it, they were so scared they couldn't do much of anything. But when it was over, the leaders of all the Israelites came to Moses. Verse 24, And ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man and he liveth. <laughs> to them, this was a huge miracle that God could appear and talk to the human race and they wouldn't all be dead. And so to them it was amazing. But they didn't want to hear it again. They didn't want to take the chance again. And I was thinking about this. You know, God wanted them to have the exact opposite reaction. He wanted them to see in the fact that God is so powerful and he's so uh, able to destroy what he didn't destroy, that they would want to him to come back, that they would want to hear more from him. But instead, they didn't want to hear anything more from him. We go on in verse 25. Now, therefore, why should we die? It's like they're thinking, well, this time we didn't die, but next time we're going to die. That's a little confusing why they couldn't figure that out. Yeah, but it was so scary, you know. And then it says, for this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, then we shall die. So, you know, the problem is that they weren't converted, really, uh, other than Moses and, and probably his, his wife and some of the others there, Joshua and Caleb. But the rest of them, they just weren't converted. And you notice also... <clears throat> that the Pharisees who were not converted, they didn't like to be around Jesus. It, it was very troublesome to them. And they, they came around to try to trap him, but they didn't really enjoy being around him. 
So it takes a spiritual condition that would cause us to be willing to endure this kind of an experience. Now I did find some comments on this text in verse 25. Patriarchs and Prophets 304. On the morning of the third day, as the eyes of all the people were turned toward the mount, its summit was covered with a thick cloud, which grew more black and dense, sweeping downward until the entire mountain was wrapped in darkness, an awful mystery. So when it mentions the darkness, this describes it in more detail, that it started higher up and it, and it swept down and engulfed the people and you know, when it's not supposed to be dark, it's kind of scary. Uh, some people even get scared in a cave when, when they turn out the lights. But uh, to have this unnatural darkness, then a sound as of a trumpet was heard, summoning the people to meet with God. And Moses led them forth to the base of the mountain. From the thick darkness flashed vivid lightnings, while peals of thunder echoed and re-echoed among the surrounding heights. For, uh, I don't remember how long, but at least a year, might have been two years. We lived in a, a what had been built to be a garage, but we were planning to build a house but we ended up leaving Wildwood before we built, got the house built. And it was up on top of, not clear on top of the mountain behind Wildwood, but it was up on one of the higher points. And within just uh, maybe 100 feet of the house was a high tension wire uh, pole and, and wires. And I remember one lightning storm that took place there, I mean, it seemed like it was striking that tower. And it was a scary thing to be that close to, I've never been that close to lightning before. And so I can imagine what they were experiencing. Yes. I was in our yard up in New York, enjoying the light show when the electric storm came on. Well, one went Flashed him immediately. <laughs> uh, when the boom comes immediately with the flash, I get back on the porch really fast. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <clears throat> and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. The glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the sight of the assembled multitude. And the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder. So terrible were the tokens of Jehovah's presence that the hosts of Israel shook with fear. So they were unable you know, to stand. They were just totally shaking and fell upon their faces before the Lord. Even Moses exclaimed, I exceedingly fear and quake. That's taken from Hebrews 12, 21. So even, even one who was truly converted and was, you know, totally submitted to God's leading in his life, even he said, I was scared to death. I exceedingly uh, feared and quaked. So this was an event that it's very hard for us to picture, but the people uh, didn't want to go through that again. They said, we'll die if we go through it again, yes. When things are going along pretty well, we can feel pretty big mm -hmm. and fail to realize how boring we are. That's right. 
I think that's one of the reasons why some of the natural disasters occur to help human beings reduce in size. You know, human nature is so helpless against a, a tsunami, for instance, or a flood even, or a tornado. I mean, just, it, it helps us to see who we really are. In Fundamentals, page 506, it says the people of Israel were overwhelmed with terror. They shrank away from the mountain in fear and awe. So they started backing up, you know, away from the mountain. They fell on their faces and I, I could see them scrambling to get back up again. And then they start trying to get away from the mountain. Testimonies to Ministers, page 99. The people overwhelmed with a sense of guilt. That was the big problem. That presence of God brought a ter terror of guilt. And fearing to be consumed by the glory of the presence of the Lord had entreated Moses. And we heard the entreaty there. Uh, first volume of Spirit of Prophecy, page 249, after quoting all the way from verse 23 to 29, it says, Moses then presented before them their disgraceful conduct in worshiping a calf, the work of man, in the place of offering sincere devotion to the living God. Now, we know that the reason why God did this was to inspire them with a desire to worship Him. The gods of Egypt weren't able to do that. There was nothing they could compare this with. And so God was hoping that they would develop a, a sense of His power, and yet He didn't kill them, and that they would want to worship Him. But instead, in a few days, they were worshiping the golden calf. Their disgraceful conduct in worshiping a calf, the work of man, in the place of offering sincere devotion to the living God. He pointed them to the broken tables of stone, which represented to them that Thus had they broken the covenant which they had so recently made with God. We'll read uh, a little bit about that as we go farther in this. But you know, <clears throat> one thought that I think we need to get from this, since we didn't see it firsthand, do you think we have a struggle with reverence around God? You know, we don't sense the power, the, the awesomeness of being in God's presence. And He, he wants to be present. Go ahead. And Sabbath especially. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you, you folks are pretty reverent here, you know, on Friday night. But <clears throat> it seems like when we get a church full that as Adventists we really lack in reverence. And I believe it stems back to not grasping what happened there at Sinai. If we saw more plainly what that was like, and, and the Lord has tried to help us to see it both in the Bible and in the writings of Ellen White, so that we can get an idea of what it's like if we want God to be here. You know, I wonder if He is here sometimes. If, if it's too irreverent, Maybe He can't be here with us. But if we are truly reverent, it's because we understand who He is. And we want to meet with Him. We want to experience His presence. And, you know, we won't die. We can see from that we won't. Fourth Testimonies, page 514. If all in Battle Creek now that's General Conference Headquarters. You know, sometimes people think uh, everything at the General Conference is 
fine. It has to be only good up there. But that wasn't true back then. So, if all in Battle Creek stood true to the light God has given them, true to the interests of the church, feeling the worth of souls for whom Christ died, a different influence would be exerted. But here we see acted over to a great extent the experience of the children of Israel. And it's talking about Mount Sinai and what happened there. And it says at Battle Creek, we have the same problems. As the people stood before Mount Sinai listening to the voice of God, they were so forcibly impressed with his sacred presence that they retreated in terror and cried out to Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. So we'll come to that in a minute. But that was their conclusion. Moses, you do the talking with God. We don't want to have him talk with us anymore. <clears throat> there before the mount, they made solemn vows of allegiance to God. But scarcely had the thunders and the trumpet and the voice of the Lord ceased when they were bowed upon their knees before an idol. Now that's counsel to the head church in Battle Creek, which was where the general conference officers attended, going to church there. So, you know, I'll give you one idol that a lot of people are bowing to, and that is rock music. And uh, I dare say that there's individuals in the general conference who think it's okay to have that kind of music, and so, you know, the counsel that was given is still valid today. And God is wanting, even at the top, He's wanting them to recognize where the changes need to be made to come back into line with what God wants. Okay, we'll read a little more here. Um, Verse 26, uh, for the next few verses, I didn't find any specific comments. It says, For who is there of all flesh that hath heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and live? He said, Can you go back in history and find anybody that heard that and stayed alive? Well, you know, God never did do this before. This was the first time that he did that. So, well, he spoke to Adam and Eve after they sinned, I guess. But uh, other than that, uh, we don't see any record of that. Moses at the burning bush. Well, that's true. Yeah, Moses, although it wasn't, it, it wasn't like Mount Sinai. No, he was worn with shoes off. Yeah, right. <laughs> So 27, go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say. And speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. Um, when I read that, I think of a, a child. Let's say that they're not supposed to eat cookies between meals. And so they go in the kitchen and they are pulling out a cookie from the jar and just then mother walks in. And the child is afraid they will be punished. So they make all kinds of promises. I will never do it again. You know, they're scared. They make a lot of promises while they're scared. But if they had a chance to get another cookie when mother wasn't watching, they'd probably do it. And so 
And, you know, maybe these people really believed that they would obey what God asked them to do. Maybe they really thought they would do it or could do it. But this is not the reaction. I don't believe this is the reaction that God was asking for. He was asking them to see themselves as they really were. And if we do, if we see ourselves as we really are, we can't promise God we'll never do it again. All we can say is, Lord, if you will give me the strength, if you will give me the power, I want to obey, but I don't have the power to obey. But if you will strengthen me, if you will help me, then I will be able to obey. But they did not have a clue. They were used to the gods of Egypt, and you had to appease the gods. You had to, uh, at least on the surface, to cooperate with the god. And so they promised to Moses, if you get the instructions from God, then we'll be sure and do it all. But the later history, they hardly did any of it. It's... Uh, it's a very hollow promise. Verse 28, And the Lord heard the voice of your words. Remember now he's recounting this. The Lord heard your words, and he didn't talk to them anymore. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when ye spake unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Now, he doesn't mean by saying that, that I'm glad they said it. But he's saying, okay, we will accept what they've asked, and I won't talk to them anymore. I will talk to you, Moses, and you share with them, but I won't talk to them anymore. So he, he accepted, you know, and you find this frequently in the Bible. When we want something, God gives it to us. If we say, Lord, what do you want me to have? Then he will tell us what he wants. But if we don't care what he wants, he often gives us what we want. Let's take uh, a king. You know, God never planned, never wanted them to have a king. But they said, we want a king. We want to be like all the nations. And you know, I, I think there's a, another way in which in more modern times we have said that. I hope I don't shock anybody by this, but... I believe that it was not necessary in God's work to convince all Adventists, or almost all Adventists, who are going to you know, have an important position, that they have to have a degree. And uh, it's like if you don't get one, you, you can't be used for much of anything. I don't think that that's what God had in mind. I think he wanted a whole lot of people that didn't take all those years and years of study to get into the work quicker and to accomplish things faster. But, you know, when we said that's what we want, we want to be like the other uh, nations, we want to be like the other churches, and he said, okay, if you want to be like them, go ahead, you can be like them but you're going to have to do the same thing they're doing. There's probably more ways, but that's just one, one way. About seminary, the requirement of having seminary be pastor? Well, you know, that's just another step. There, the, today, if you're not a PhD, you're nobody. And so... In what circles? All educated circles. Right. If, you're not, if you're not a PhD... Well, we don't need to listen to you. Yes. Do they start their doctoral examination with, with prayer? 
I don't know. I never got my doctorate. <laughs> I, I didn't even get an advanced degree. I, I did go through college because I didn't know uh, another way. But then when I got to Wildwood uh, and started studying true education, I said, well, I'm not going any farther. So if anybody listens to me, it has to be the Holy Spirit because I don't have, I don't have an MD. I don't have a BD. I don't have a PhD. <laughs> now we come to verse 29, and uh, this one is really a really beautiful verse. You know, the Old Testament isn't as liberal about a heart relationship with God. But it's there. If you look for it, it's there. And here's one of those places. Verse 29. Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Now, you can't read that text and say that God is pleased or that he wanted a legalistic relationship with him where you kept the Ten Commandments out of duty primarily. You can't say that with that verse. I call this God's heart cry. He's saying, oh, I wish that they would let me change their hearts. I wish that they would let me convert them because if they would allow me to convert them, then when they keep the commandments, they would be doing it because they want to do it, not because they feel they have to. Yes? I haven't looked them up yet, but there are five references, five marginal references to other places that probably say the same thing. Okay. Yeah, you're probably right. Now let's, let's uh, capitalize on this one for a few minutes. In uh, Signs of the Times of May 20, 1880, it says, The majesty of heaven here shows that he takes no pleasure in punishing the transgressor. But when his righteous laws are trampled upon, he must maintain the honor of of his throne. He delights to bestow his blessings upon all who will value them. It's like he was saying, oh, that they would let me make them a commandment keeper. And it has to be from the heart. Oh, that they would let me make them love the commandments. You know, David said, oh, I love God's commandments. I like to think about them all day Obviously, David received what this verse, what God is wishing he could give to everybody. Pastor, isn't that in a sense um, that God is saying that, you know, all of these people who keep my commandments, meaning I'll empower you through my spirit, my Holy Spirit within you. Yes, yes. That's what we want. Yes, even the Old Testament makes plain about the indwelling of the Spirit. But the New Testament makes it really clear. <laughs> then it quotes our verse, Oh, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. You know, I've heard some pastors talk about when hellfire is burning that God is laughing in heaven. But we don't see that here, do we? No. His pain, you know, to destroy his children <clears throat> brings a lot of pain. And he longs that they will be in a position where he doesn't have to destroy them. Can you imagine seeing your loved ones outside the city? Yeah, it's going to be very painful, isn't it? This covers all who should live on the earth till the close of time, all who come under the mediation of Jesus Christ. The prosperity of all depends upon their obedience to God's requirements. 
the heart that is steadfastly fixed upon the Lord will not think slightly of his law himself, nor give it less regard and reverence because of the universal disrespect which it receives. So, <clears throat> when God works that miracle in our heart, we, we like God's commands. We love them. And we see the value in keeping them. So, uh, I noticed, you know, the conservative element of Protestantism believes in keeping nine commands. Have you noticed that? They believe keeping nine. And they stress the importance, not just Adventists that stress the importance of the commands. But both uh, stations in Chattanooga stress that. At least some of the speakers do. They stress the importance of obeying God's commandments. But it's from the heart, not from duty only. In proportion as it is disregarded and despised by the masses, will it become precious to the God-fearing and obedient? Is that what's happening in our hearts? As you see homosexual, homosexuality, and all the other breaking of God's law, does it make you cherish the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, and really seek to be obedient to that and demonstrate obedience? What a blessing it would be if every Seventh-day Adventist would do that. No more adultery in the Adventist church. No more, um, you know, sexual sin before marriage and so on if, if this is what was taking place. And we could go down the whole list. And see, so this is a time when God is saying, make sure that you let me fully live in your heart so that you can be a demonstration of God's law. Every bit of it, people can see. It is possible to be a commandment keeper. God does have the power to do that in human beings' lives. <clears throat> Said David, they have made void thy law, therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, than fine gold. So David had that reaction as he watched all the breaking of the law. It made him love the law more, it made him want to live it more than he ever had before. Um, before and after, you know, his, his problem with Bathsheba was a detour for, for David. And it came about because he got lifted up due to so much success. And not only did he have a lot of success, he, his army was so powerful that he didn't even have to go to war anymore. He could stay home. And have you ever heard that uh, idleness is the devil's workshop? Yeah. And so those kind of things converged on David and he messed up really bad. But he got back in his connection with God and he finished out his life in the right relationship with God. <clears throat> Desire of Ages 668. All true obedience comes from the heart. So, let's look at it the opposite way. If you obey the commandments out of duty only, it's not obedience. You know, a lot of people think it is, but it's not. Obedience has to come from the heart. We have to obey because we want to obey. Because we're listening to the spiritual mind that God gives us. And, you know, we have both minds. We have the carnal mind still, and we have the spiritual mind. And we don't, from my study, we don't even get rid of the, the uh, carnal mind until 
the resurrection morning. But so it's still there, and it can still suggest. But if we're listening to the spiritual mind, the spiritual mind says, don't do it, because you don't want to do it. That's what God created in us, to not want to do it. And so uh, that's the only kind of obedience that can be accepted by God. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be by carrying out our own impulses. Does that make you want to claim that? I mean, this to me is one of the most beautiful promises that I have read. To think that through the power of Christ, what I want to do can be exactly what Jesus wants me to do. You know, how come we're not asking more for that? We should put this somewhere where we can see it every day and say, Lord, this is what I want. You promised it, and I've come to collect it for today, that what I want to do is exactly what you want me to do. But then sometimes I think we do exactly what he wants us to do, and then we go and second-guess ourselves. That can happen, that's right. I mean, you can wake up in the morning and surrender your life to God and tell him you want to receive wisdom from him, and, and you'll read James 1.5. And it says, clearly, if you don't believe you got the wisdom, you're worthless. And so you go throughout your day and just trusting Him. And if it doesn't go the way you planned, who's to say that you did it wrong? That's true. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of people feeling guilty for the way their day went, when if they just trust God to have been in the midst of it and leave themselves alone, they'd be a lot less depressed. <laughs> you're right there. When we do what God says, He doesn't always promise that it'll be rosy or that it'll go good or whatever. That's right. Very good point. goes on to say, uh, the will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing His service. So here's another tremendous blessing. When He moves into our life, he wants to so identify himself with us so that serving him and doing his work is the only thing we care about. We just want to, to do his work. Now that doesn't mean you have to be a traditional you know, worker for God because wherever we are, we can be a worker for God. But of course, we should care about God's work. You know, So often his work goes crippled because there's not enough people. And you're probably aware that in Adventist hospitals, most of the workers are not Adventists. How come? I mean, there should be so many Adventists trying to get in there and work there that, that there wouldn't be room for any non-Adventists to work in there. You see? But where where is the zeal for God's work? And then there's the mission field and all the rest that's in desperate need. When we know God as it is our privilege to know Him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Wow. And you might not even know it. You might not know it, but that's what it'll be. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. So, we won't want to do it, and on the other side, we will love to do what's right. That's a beautiful promise, and we'll stop with that. That's a good way to start the Sabbath. <clears throat>